Hi, my name is Derek James, and for all of you that have looked at parts one, two, this is the intro to part three, where I speak about intellectual property. And the idea in the intellectual property part of the talk is to speak about how music is intellectual property and how you can build value around your music and how you can mess it up by using the case of a singer by the name of Kerry Hilson, who was big in 2007, eight, nine, uh, ran around with some of the biggest producers in the world and what she did to actually mess up her career, the great thing is this, is that all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reference her case study, but all you've got to do is go to the link below, or that might be um, on the screen, and type that in on YouTube, and you will find a 15, 20 minute presentation about uh, Kerry Hilson, nothing to do with me, but I think it's a good synopsis of her career, how she was on the way up, and what she did to destroy it, and the idea of using that as a reference is really simple. She was pretty much in the same type of position as a Lady Gaga. In other words, she was behind the scenes in the industry, was writing for some of the biggest names in the music business. And they were looking at Kerry Hilson as being the next kind of Rihanna, Stroke, Beyonce. And she had the position to do it, but she messed it up. So the point is this, is that in the world of intellectual property, how you go about creating something that is intellectual property, that will have a value, has changed because the music industry has changed in the last, let's just say 100 years, but I'm gonna rewind the clock back around about 300 years ago, and in terms of my time reference, I haven't looked it up, but when we think of a guy by the name of Mozart, we understand that there was no such thing as um, the music industry as we know it now. Mozart was somebody who was sponsored by a king. Mozart was somebody who, in a nutshell, was the, one of the most famous artists of his day. And if you wanted to take an interest or follow Mozart, you couldn't buy CDs, you couldn't buy vinyl, you couldn't uh, use Spotify, you had to buy sheet music, okay, paper. And if you were a pianist, you would then play Mozart yourself. In other words, you entertained yourself using uh, sheet music as the means by which you would play the compositions of Mozart, but that was the only way in which they could monetize music way back then. Fast forward a bit and you move into the early days of what we'd call the mass media business and the cinema business had opened up in the late 1800s. It was all silent movies and if you were a musician you could be involved with composing the music that would go along with various movies and if you were a musician who lived in various towns across um, the Western world where there was a cinema, you could be a musician employed to play along with the images that you would see on screen. You then move forward a bit and then there was this great invention called the radio. And so people that were musicians could have their music played on air, wow. And with that played on air status, bands and artists, not as we know them now, became famous. Great composers became greater composers because of being able to be aired on radio. You fast forward to 1927, so that's nearly 100 years ago, 1927 and this uh, new invention called cinema that had been with us for about 20 years before that then had sound added to it. So movies were no longer silent and if you were a musician, you could get paid as a composer with your music now being part of the film industry. But everybody who was a pit musician who would play in the cinemas across the world, um, they all lost jobs. There was no more cinema, sorry, there was no more silent movie business. The silent movie business had ended with the silent movie business ended and soundtracks being added to films. The musicians that were once gainfully employed all lost their jobs. Why? Because soundtracks came with a film. Fast forward a bit more and uh, television, about another 20 years, television became the main thing. And with TV, there was this idea that sounds, um, or should I say musicians and their face could then be added to the broadcast spectrum. If you think about it, that's kind of like where people like Bill Haley, uh, Elvis Presley, um, Muddy Walters, and we can go on. Little Richard became famous because of this thing called television, giving musicians not only airtime like the radio, but visual time in the form of TV. Fast forward a few years later, and then you've got the evolution and the development of this thing called MTV. And with MTV, you have got bands and artists that can become famous because of having a camera pointed there at them. And this thing called a music video being the news medium of the time that would take an unknown artist to the world to the 18 to 35 demographic and with that 18 to 35 demographic now being able to see their 
or being able to see new artists, the way in which record labels decided to sign artists, primarily based on the way that they looked, um, became the modus operandi of the day. Fast forward to kind of like where we are now, or no, just to say, let's just say the uh, kind of a uh, mid 90s, late 90s, and this thing called the internet is starting to turn up and with the internet people are getting music for free record labels are pulling their hair out they don't know what to do because the public is getting access to music without having to pay for it oh my goodness there's a problem now i there was an important point in time that i missed out and i'm not saying that was deliberate it's kind of like the way in which my mind was scrolling through the time frames but we need to go back to the time of the 1940s when this thing called tin pan alley ruled the roost with regards to music all music, most music, 90% of all music that came to the world was kind of like Tim Pan Alley um, productions. In other words, the people that made the movie business work were the same people that were also scoring the big type of hits that would also come from uh, the films that we would go and see. Now, here's the problem. If you weren't part of Tim Pan Alley, the place where most of the big music composers were, the big publishing houses were, um, then the likelihood of you being able to get into the music industry was almost impossible because Tim Pan Alley, as part of the big media conglomerate of the, of the day, owned everything. Now we move forward into the MTV era that I've just started to mention, and we see a different world. So we understand that the Beatles turned up, um, and the reason why I've gone back again to the Beatles is because my time frame's messed up. But when the Beatles turned up in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, so Bill H Haley, the Beatles, um, the early Rolling Stones, and we can go on. There was something that signif something of significance took place. Tim Panali was kicked out of business because the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Bill Haley and the Comets, uh, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, and we can go on. They all wrote their own music. Now, with them writing their own music, there was a, there was something going on here because the Tim Pan Alley model, where they would have the orchestras that would play the music, that would record the music in the studios, that the singers like uh, Doris Day would sing along to, those people that owned the music industry back then weren't letting anybody in, um, and Tim Pan Alley was kind of like the gateway into. And if you wanted to be a musician, you'd have to sign a contract with a Tim Pan Alley-based um, uh, music outfit. It was just the only way to work. But you couldn't play rock and roll. Now, I want you to listen to this. You couldn't play rock and roll with an orchestra. And at the time, and if you look at recent BBC history, at the time, there were the music industry um, unions that would protect the job of musicians. Now, I want you to listen to this. And those jobs of musicians were uh, protected in all sorts of ways. And one of the ways was this. M music could not be performed on television unless, now I want you to listen to this, unless a musician's union, music, uh, music people, perform that music. So you can go back to um, TV shows in England like Top of the Pops in the early 70s and all of the music that was played on Top of the Pops was played by musicians union members. So I want you to imagine this. Imagine a reggae song where you need that, you know, you need the serious bass line and all that kind of stuff. Or imagine today's uh, techno music, all right, any kind of a EDM uh, soundtrack being played by an orchestra because that's the only way that the, the musicians union could think about how to protect the jobs of. Now, the point that I'm making here is this, is that we know that there are lots of music sounds today that can't be played by orchestras and quote unquote protected musicianship. It's stupid. Now, the reason for me saying that is this, is that the music industry has always been evolving. New laws have had to be created. Old laws have had to be um, discarded. Why? Because there were certain laws, certain protectionist laws that were just dumb. And again, when you've got bands and artists like Chuck Berry turning up, the Beatles turn up and we can go on. They make other forms of musicianship trying to perform their art form look ludicrous. And where we are today in this new internet world of the delivery of music is that there are old ways of doing things that are in direct opposition to and clashing with new ways of doing things. That's it. And so unions trying to work out where the music, music industry is going now and how they can have a stake in the industry is kind of like they're in flux. Once upon a time, some of the biggest producers in the world, so I'm going to go back to a time when there were brand names like Stock Aiken and Waterman, when there was Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, Teddy Riley, these are more recent names because we haven't gone through the Motown period, but some of the more recent names, when they were some of the biggest studios in the world, and you can go to London where some of the biggest production houses were in the world, those guys are not in business anymore because 
Once upon a time, the only people that had access to computerized musicianship were some of the most successful bands and artists who could then invest in the studios that would then become the dominant sound um, creators of more recent music history, okay? What then happened with the democratization of technology, where most people have got some kind of studio recording facility on a laptop, okay? With people having access to all kinds of recording facilities and sampling, which became really big in the kind of like, you know, like uh, mid 80s, early 90s, the arrival of hip hop, craft work, and we can go on. What took place then was that people didn't even need to be musicians. They would just sample the tracks of other people, craft the way in which the sound was cut together, mask it if possible, so you couldn't actually recognize the original source and now people had a music music had music tracks that they could sing along to create hits win grammys and make a whole bunch of money without obviously the tim pan alley being the model without needing a jimmy jam and terry lewis without needing a stock cake in the waterman and most people today who are involved with music may have access to some form of recording facility at home that they've bought on a pc for maybe less than i don't know if you're going to talk in dollars seven seven hundred dollars in english money 500 pounds okay now with all of those with all of those changes we can see the music industry of today and the music industry of yesterday are completely different houses that we we don't live in the same space but what I need to do now is speak about funding so that we've got an idea of where we are from a financial point of view now I might have you might have seen something like this before but we're going to spin this in a different direction in this um, presentation it's a it's a brochure for um, uh, a, a, an MA in media you could spend about thirty thousand pounds in English money it's going to be a lot more you know in American dollars about seventy thousand dollars on a three-year course that you will do to study something in media so it doesn't matter whether it happens to be broadcasting journalism music production and we can go on there's a problem today and what we see in uh, this magazine this newspaper is a, a report about how loans to become a student are now equal to the cost of a mortgage because there are some people with their student loans they're not paying these student loans off until they're 50 okay so what we can see is this is that at the point in time in history where media tools are more accessible so you can buy a camera for next to nothing you can buy a recording um, facility because what this is being recorded on in terms of the audio is something else but you can buy recording facilities for relatively cheap you can edit on laptops okay but the cost of being educated in media is still big money now behind me and again if you look from another perspective behind me there is a, a major block of flats in america you use the term apartments and what we had in england a few months ago was a major fire and i'll pull out the newspaper that covers that a major fire where a uh, apartment but set a, a, a store uh, something like 12 story block of uh, flats more than 12 stories actually went up like a roman candle because the materials around which that a uh, housing block was built was flammable they had covered it with a an exterior coating cladding and although the although the building itself was safe the cladding on the outside was was flammable what then took place in england was there were a lot of uh, uh city councils that then started to look at how their building safety was and what they found out was that in england it was a hundred percent all they were all they all failed safety tests and the reason why they all fail safety tests is because they all followed the same model of all using the same type of materials to um, do the job that those materials, they, they basically they tried to do an expensive job with cheap materials and because they paid less than what they should have done for grade standard life saving protecting materials, everywhere in England has got some type of fault with its uh, multi-storey buildings that have used this cladding as a means by which to make the exterior look pretty. Now. Uh, there's been a bit of a wrangle in the UK with regards to student debts because everybody understands that if you are going to study in your early 20s and you can't pay your student debt off until your 50s, it's the kind of noose around people's neck that most don't want. Now, 
I run a course in Oxford, as you all know. Some of you have already come to the course. Um, some of you from different parts of England are going to look to come because I run a course in Oxford that is all about getting into the entertainment industry where I help people get into the, into, into the entertainment industry by getting beside, behind the scenes in the entertainment industry and then they're able to work their way forward. If you live in Oxford, you don't have to pay for the course. If you live outside of Oxford, you might have to pay a bit of money because anybody who has got an OX postcode um, their course is paid for free by the government and I've just run the first six weeks that was the kind of like the test run what we're now looking to do is run it national bringing people from all over England all over the world to this course because it's really simple getting behind the entertainment getting behind the scenes in the entertainment industry has changed a lot in the last 30 years and once upon a time you would have local studios so it doesn't matter whether you live in texas new york california everybody who was in the music industry or trying to get into the music industry were following particular types of models so if you run a recording studio your model would be the producer model where you're now making music with um, the hope that the artists that you're recording in your studio, some of them will have major label potential. They then go off into the major label world and you're now earning royalties from that artist that has become successful. In more recent times, we have seen artists who are looking to, and uh, studios looking to promote artists on, um, in the online world, hoping that that's gonna be the means by which their artists find, uh, find success and stardom. Right, uh, uh, we all know that sound. If you're in a game show, it means that you've made a mistake. Right, why do that? In the IFP report of 2009, and it comes out every year, the major labels did a study on the amount of label, the amount of artists that there were online, and the amount of those artists who were able to make it to the mainstream world with the online with the online world being their major source of promotion. What the major labels found out was that everybody who's trying it online, and when I say everybody, almost everybody, so you might be one of these almost everybody, who is trying it online, it's not working, and the reason why it's not working, in a nutshell, is major labels broke down how much it cost them to turn an artist into a superstar. So there was music video costs, tour support costs, advertising costs, um, music video costs, and we can go on with all the costs, and uh, you can see that cost list in here, and if you want to just download the uh, 2009 FP report, do that, you can go to go straight to pages eight and nine and you can see how much it costs a major label to break an artist now if you haven't got that kind of money behind you you are in a problem why because what it means is is that you are in the middle of nowhere uh, a voice in the middle of the desert you are a message in a bottle trying to be seen by a gazillion people now in Techmix magazine, which I've shown you in, an, in one of the earlier presentations, you see how now technology has turned up that's giving people the ability to get in contact with up to a billion people. That's just the way tech is going. Um, I don't want to repeat something that I've already said, but in my 2012 book, I spoke about how it's going in the direction of people being able to get in contact with a billion people. I have now set up what you would call an IP creation company. Now, again, in the second part of this presentation, I speak about IPs. IPs is the way in which you look at any product that is going to be sold through media. So, Harry Potter, the book, is an IP. Harry Potter, the film, is an IP. Um, Mickey Mouse is an IP. Uh, a Lady Ga Gaga song is an IP. Your songs are not IPs. The reason why they're not IPs is, is that your song doesn't have a value. So, let me explain that like this. If I bought the catalog, the song catalog of Michael Jackson, Paul McCartney, U2, Coldplay, Lady Gaga, Rihanna, Beyonce, and we can go on with all of the names that have existed in the last 50 years of popular music, Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, and we can go on. If I bought their catalog and I had access to their publishing rights, I would make a gazillion pounds, a gazillion dollars. Why? Because all of those IPs have value within the context of they're in, they're in soundtracks, they're, and every time that a song by Frank Sinatra is in a soundtrack, they would have to come to me, give me some money, and pay me for the right to have Frank Sinatra's track in um, in a film. Now, there's a track where Frank Sinatra sings about New York, New York, what a wonderful... No, that's in... Uh, the film has gone by me now. Singing in the rain, I think. Okay, but there's another track where Frank Sinatra sings about how great New York is and so on. So if they're going to do a film where they've got a New York scene and then they want that big band Frank Sinatra soundtrack in it, they have to pay me for the right to rent it for it to be in the movie. That's what I mean by an IP because everybody knows the soundtrack. The soundtrack when used in, uh, in a movie kind of sets the scene for what's going to happen next. Does that make sense? Okay. So unless you get a commission to do a brand new film, unless you get a commission 
where your albums now can become IPs where, I don't know if you've seen the uh, uh, film, um, God, Hancock starring Will Smith and he's the superhero that's the drunk, okay. In that film, a track by the name of Ice-T is played, rapper big in the 1990s, um, and the track is Colours. So Will Smith is now in prison in this film, Hancock. And um, th so they use the soundtrack, uh, Colours, done by Ice-T, to set the stage of the bad boy in jail scene. All right. But the point that's been made here is this, is that the reason why they used uh, colours by Ice T is because everybody knows it and it set the scene for that film or so I say it set it set it set the mood for that scene in the film them calling on your track to do the same thing is pretty slim all right so the reason why they use known songs in a lot of films is simple they actually evoke certain moods now we're going to move away from that because the idea is this is what I need to speak to you about in this section before we go to the IP section is about money Right. So I've just spoken about how you've got people who, um, in the world of education, if they go and they seek to get educated, it may cost them a lot of money. Most people, when trying to get into the music industry, we're just because obviously this presentation here is about the music business, not the film industry, not the theatre business. And if you go to our website, um, you'll see that I'm involved with things that are involved with film, theatre, music. OK, because all of these things are IPs. If you go to uh, any event, at a stadium like this the the premise or where you're actually um operating from in terms of your seating is going to is going to is going to dictate the viewpoint that you get of all of the action that is taking place if you had a camera in a cherry picker then you're going to get different types of angles you're going to be able to see different types of things because the medium through which you are looking at the action in the stadium i.e the cherry picker is giving you a vantage point that other people simply do not have now with that vantage point comes a different way of seeing things and you are going to see things in a way that everybody else in the stadium isn't going to see them. You're just, you are in a different uh, perspective. Now, I want you to imagine everything that I said in the opening part of this uh, statement or this presentation being applied to you as if you were a time traveller. If you had an interest in music in the era of Mozart, the only way in which you could make more money if you were Mozart was to sell sheet music. So you were a publishing company that sold sheet music, but that's the only way Mozart could make more money. If you then fo fast forward to the era of music in films, so that's post-1927, the way in which Mozart could make money as a composer then is completely different. If you rewind the clock of uh, uh, about two decades to the early inception of radio, then you could get royalties from this thing called radio if your music was played a lot on the radio. But each of those mediums and each of those methods of you gaining access to the masses changed based on the time period that you were in. Okay, so if we now go to where we are now, the time period that we're in now is the live entertainment industry period. And the live entertainment industry period that we're in now is completely different to the 1970s where you had the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. The reason why we're in a different world now and then is because if you think about uh, the Rolling Stones, it was all uh, drugs, rock and roll, uh, LSD. Uh, you had the Beatles singing songs like that, but the Beatles had already disbanded by the time the 70s had turned up. So it was, it was really uh, Mick Jagger doing his thing then. You had uh, the Vietnam War, where everybody was rallying against the Vietnam War, and with the Vietnam War came uh, the counterculture, and everybody saying, give peace a chance, and everybody was kind of like a hippie. Um, you had the Black Panthers doing their thing. Uh, you had uh, people making the Black Panther salute at the Olympics, and we can go on. So 1970s was kind of turbulent, um, and if you were a musician in the 1970s, then it was easy to find a cultural agenda to be part of and be part of the counterculture. Where we are now, the music industry is primarily about entertainment, but with this internet age that we are now in, we have seen record labels, some lose up to 50% of their sales, but the bands and artists that are still big are making most of their money doing stuff live. We can also look at another thing that has taken place that is completely different to then, which is this idea of the internet being the means by which people are getting music for free, not paying for it, but it being the tool by which you can get people to know you. Right, independent labels, and I was around when, I used to be involved with the anti-piracy technologies that major labels were using when they were, when they were f they are fearful for losing all their money. 
and the fear was kind of, well, I'm not saying justified, but we understand that in America, Tower Records, the, the, the national chain there has disappeared. In England, HMV has almost all disappeared. So the way in which people buy music now in terms of going to a local store, that doesn't exist anymore. And the importance of store-based record sales for touring once upon a time was the way in which major labels would plan how they were going to do a tour. So when you think about a chess game, because in this part of the presentation, we're talking about you and understanding your strategy. You can't have a Mozart strategy because we don't even buy sheet music now. So that strategy is so dead in the water that it's not, it's not even, there's no point in even looking at it as a means by which you can make money from music, okay? So no more sheet music. But back in the 1970s, 80s, a bit before that, any piece of music that was sold that had a barcode on it, now I want you to understand this, any piece of music that was sold that had a barcode on it, they would use the barcodes as a means by which they could plot where records were being sold and then based on them knowing where records were being sold around a country or around the world, the world, the world record companies could then go ahead and plan local tours or national tours based on how many people had bought records and them knowing where the fans were. Okay. But as record sales went down, and it's now, we're now in the, the Spotify era, where people are listening and streaming music, but you don't know where the fans are, you've got, let's just say Shakira, with 105 social media fans, she can put out a notice that she's involved with a, a national tour, and her tour can be sold out in two minutes, literally. Because everybody's gone online, bought all of the tickets, the tickets are gone, and they know that every city that they go to, in a venue like this, or a lot bigger, they know it's going to be sold out. Why? Because there are enough fans for Lady Gaga to engage with online, for Beyonce to engage in online, for Rihanna to engage in online, for Shakira to engage in online, and we can go on with the actors, like people like, um, oh gosh, the guy's name has gone from me and it'll come back in a moment. Um, but you've got actors who are able to, or should I say comedians, um, Hart, second name is Hart, the first name will come to me, um, Kevin Hart. You've got people like Kevin Hart, uh, Shakira, Rihanna and so on that have got so many social media followers that they can do tours, whether it happens to be uh, com stand-up comedy tours or music tours, where they can sell out a venue, venues, strings of venues, in hours. Now, if you are an artist in today's world, the last thing you should be thinking about is spending a whole bunch of money on maybe recording albums when one, you might not have developed your sound or more correctly, the way in which you could go about getting your music could be a lot cheaper. Now I'm setting up something called uh, the Rewind Finance Network and the way that that works is this. If you're a band or an artist, you want money to uh, record an album, we can help you get the money. Do not spend more than, uh, I don't think you should spend more than $5,000 on recording a complete album. In actual fact, what I think you should be doing is spending money on recording maybe one, two, three or four tracks so you don't need us to help you finance it. And then from the tracks that you've recorded, start using those as the means by which you build up a fan base. Okay, now there's a reason why I say it and I say it like this. In the 90s and before, you could sample people's music and the way in which people got famous in the 1980s with early hip-hop was they sampled everything and they didn't even give any um, attention to the uh, music laws. What then happened to a lot of those people that were involved with sampling in the 80s was that they lost a whole bunch of money. In fact, some of them lost all of the royalties to the music that they had put together through sampling because the record label said, look, you're using our music to make your music and that isn't really creativity. We want our percentage of the royalties from those tracks that you have sold and we want 100% of the money because you didn't ask us for permission. So we've now seen the evolution of the permission-based um, sampling industry and there are some bands and artists, the Beatles being one case in point, who will not allow you to sample their music. You can't use it. You use it and they will slap you on the wrist very hard. Okay. Now, the point that's being made here is this, is that once upon a time, there were super powerhouse studios that would put together the tracks that a lot of us would listen to with an understanding that these powerhouse studios had working relationships with the record companies, they would create the hits, the public would buy the hits in the form of um, vinyl, then CDs, and the studios that actually were involved in the production process made a killing multiple millions because they were making the hits. It was no longer Tim Pan Alley. Okay, now with that, there are a lot of the big studios in London that were part of the major production house network of the 1970s, 80s, 90s 
almost all of them have all gone broke. Why? Because most bands and artists now record at home on a laptop, on a PC, or some home-based recording system. Why? Because it's cheaper. And what they're now doing is they're saying, well, we'll supply you, Mr. Major Label, the music, and you pay us the studio costs, you pay us all of the royalties, we don't need a middleman. That's a change that has taken place big time. There's a, there's a remix uh, service online called Indaba Music, and what they do is they put, put up for auction, for competition, the remixes they've got available. So if Mariah Carey wants a remix, she will put it on Indaba Music. If you're a producer, you will then say, here's my version of a Mariah Carey track. If the record label likes it, they will say, okay, we'll buy that off you. They're paying you $3,000, but it's a bidding process. Now, here's where it gets kind of worse. Once upon a time, remixes used to cost $75,000. So the big producers or remixes at the time, people like um, Mars at Work and Mad Val Haddon, they would get $70,000 per remix. You do 10 of those, you're a millionaire. Okay, um, 12. You do uh, so many of those and you're a millionaire. Um, and it was because they were inventing the sa they invented the sound that became part of the remix culture of the time that everybody would buy as a DJ. Today, DJs aren't buying music, they're getting it free online. You know, it used to be that you would send DJs a promo of a track on a 12 inch with the hope that the DJ would play your track, your remix. And if you could get your track known through Clubland, via a DJ, then you had a license to make a track into a hit because of the remix, not the original version of the track. Okay, now you fast forward to where we are now. You can stand in a nightclub with a mobile phone and the, the mobile phone can record a snippet of a track that you're listening to and you can then find out what the track is because it then analyzes the track, looks at the waveform, will tell you the track, give you the link to the, um, to the place that you can download it for and you can pay for it there and then. Once upon a time, that didn't exist, now it does. So in all of this change, the issue for people is this, how do you get your stuff known? Now, remember earlier on I said that I'm involved with the IP creation business, so Harry Potter is an IP. I want you to think of the world of chess. Now, many moons ago, I used to have, well, not many moons ago, it was a couple of years ago, I used to have dreadlocks, decided to go for a change, but it took me 11 months to make a decision to, yeah, Derek, you're gonna cut your hair off, you're gonna cut your hair off, you're gonna cut your hair off. There were friends who knew I was planning to cut, I was dropping hints that I was gonna cut. Uh, it took me 11 months to kind of like make the decision because it was just like kind of, you know, getting used to a new way of doing things. But what a lot of people are involved with now in terms of their decision process is really this. They're not sure what to do because they don't know what the game is, okay? Um, and the game is more like chess now where what an artist needs to do is think in terms of, okay, for me to get from A to B, I need these tools. And so for you to win a chess match, you need to know what all of the chess pieces can do so you can bring about an end result. Needing music to turn something into an IP is not what you need. So I'm involved with a reality show that I'm involved with uh, the creation of, um, I'm developing. There are a few other things that I'm involved with that don't need human beings in terms of their ideas. Understand that. So Harry Potter is an IP. It's a book, then it became a film. That's an IP. So you can be involved in creating IPs that have nothing to do with people, but it just happens to be that in the music industry where you do need a person, one of the starting blocks that you need is an understanding of how to fill out stadiums, okay? Because you need to create an audience. A book uh, publisher needs to create an audience for its future Harry Potter, and the better you are at creating IPs, the more money you're going to make. The better you understand IP creation, whether it applies to the book industry, the film industry, the theatre business, and we can go on. The more you understand IP creation, the easier it is for you to make money. So you guys as singers, what I look to do, you guys as musicians, what I look to do is get you behind the scenes in the entertainment industry as someone who understands IP development, okay? And as an IP development person, you happen to specialize in music, all right? Now then, with that, I can get you behind the scenes in the entertainment industry where you can speak to people about IP development and what it is you do. With that type of language, what you're now able to do is meet some of the biggest names in the music industry. And what will then take place for you is you're now behind the scenes in the entertainment industry in much the same way that um, Kerry Hilson was behind the scenes in the entertainment industry and Lady Gaga was behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. Now, the thing with Kerry Hilson 
And again, you can look at the video shorts, 15 minutes, that uh, this Kerry Hilson story is in. Um, you see what you should not do to mess up your position behind the scenes in the entertainment industry. That's the kind of like what you don't want to do. With Lady Gaga, you see someone who made all of the right moves once she was behind the scenes to become where she was. Now, I'm not here to judge your creativity. That's not what I want to do. If you get behind the scenes and you are able to talk IP, which is, when I say simple, you can understand the theory. Um, what will then happen is this. You might have an IP that you're working on, and the IP that you're working on is actually your music, okay? And with your music that could be in a film, that could be in a computer game, that could be online, being seen by how many million people, the issue is that what I'm going to be showing people is how to turn their music into an IP. Now, the great thing is this. If I focus on teaching people how to fill out stadiums, they're not trying to think, how do I sell my album? How do I record an album that's going to be great? I don't know how lucky or fortunate you, you as a viewer are. You may be somebody who is living next to a studio that in terms of the production ability, the people in the studio are really great. I've known studios, I can think of two studio people, uh, in terms of distance, I don't know, uh, half an hour drive in time between the two. So then they're not really closely uh, linked to each other in terms of location. Both of the studio owners were both idiots, as far as I'm concerned, in the sense of they didn't understand how to work in specific genres. They would take any form of studio work because they were trying to sell their time at a studio and not admit their limitations. Now, this is what I mean by not admit their limitations. There's a form of music that was very popular in the uh, 1990s in the UK called drum and bass. And to make drum and bass, you needed a very specific piece of outboard equipment to make that type of music. You couldn't make the music without that piece of outboard equipment. It was impossible, okay? So when I say impossible, I mean you can't do it. All right. I used that studio as a training venue to show people how to make drum and bass. But what I did was I hired that piece of outboard equipment to take into that studio so that I could then go and teach what I needed to teach. But remember, I hired the equipment in so that I could then do what I needed to do with the students that I had. Right. About six months later, I hear that the same studio owner is working with somebody on producing a drum and bass track. But I know that that studio doesn't have the equipment to make it. So when I asked the guy who was, the, who was the client of that studio, have they got in an, and I named the piece of equipment, the guy said, no. I goes, your tracks are never going to work. And he looked at me, he goes, well, we're half th way through now. I've, got, I've started, so I've got to finish. I goes, you're better off cutting your losses. Now, he didn't cut his losses, and he didn't listen to the advice because he thought he could continue doing what he was doing with the tools that he had, which were inadequate. When you listen to the track, it didn't work. The reason why it didn't work is it's kind of like saying that you want to make a country track with artists that aren't from the country world that don't sound the part. Everything that they do is wrong, okay? So, the reason why I'm saying that is this. Today, where we are now, is that to create IPs, you need a completely different perspective, reference frame to music. So I do approach the music business with an understanding of the music industry itself, but really what I'm doing is I'm working with the music business from the perspective of understanding how to create IPs, because IPs don't have a personality. A, a reality television show doesn't have a personality. A reality television show is a format, okay? So, and a format, once it works, can be sold to anybody around the world, okay? Now, your music, you need to look at as a format. Now, it may be country, it may be R&B, it may be reggae, it may be who cares. But the point is that what you want your music to end up as is an IP. So that when you listen to some uh, music, and let's just say they're going to shoot a, a film and the Caribbean is going to be part of the, the... You hear a lot of Jimmy Cliff in um, film soundtracks. He's somebody who's got music, he's got publishing rights, and he's an IP. Because people say, oh yeah, this, the, oh, this scene, a Jimmy Cliff track would work well with this. This scene, an Elvis Presley track would work well with this. In um, the beginning of uh, the last uh, Raiders of the La... La, Ra the, the La Harrison Ford. Um, in the last Indiana Jones film, at the beginning you see the racing scene. And they're setting the time period because it's the 1950s. And in this racing scene in the 1950s, the backdrop track is Hound Dog Elvis Presley. 
Now, the point that I'm making here is that Elvis Presley is good for some soundtracks. Jimmy Cliff is good for others. Uh, we can go on and we can keep moving forward with this idea that some people's music as IPs works in that IP world. Now, with that being said, and I can bring this presentation to a close, when I held up the newspapers earlier on, I, I held up one newspaper where I used the headline, um, and I'll see if I can find it now. We used the headlines of... Uh, after this uh, fire in London, they then went and did the reports, did the research, and they found out that 100% of all of the uh, venues where uh, this particular type of cadding is used, it's like everybody, is a fi every, every housing thing is a fire trap. Because people followed a way of doing things that they thought would work, they thought they could uh, get away with spending less money, they thought they could do it their way. Much like the guy who um, went into the recording studio, and uh, messed up his track. And even though I said that track is never going to work, when he was halfway through his process, he chose to continue on in a specific direction. Now, there were two people at fault here. The first person that was at fault was the guy that was running uh, the studio. He should have told the, uh, the potential client, because that's what he was at the time, I can't help reproduce that kind of music because I don't even have the equipment to make the type of sounds that you want. So he should have been honest and said, that's not what I do. But what he did was he took the, he took the book in. Why? Because maybe he had downtime in his studio and he had to pay his rent. But there are people that make decisions like that. And the reason why I, I get people behind the scenes in the entertainment industry is really simple to understand. Once upon a time, I was involved with a process where a guy um, said he was going to get a band an audition or get them in front of major label people. He didn't do what he said he was going to do. Kept them waiting around for a number of months and they wasted not only six months but a time window that they had where they had actually filled out a pretty big uh, venue called the New Theatre in Oxford. They had all of these people there and it was like, oh, and what the guy didn't do who had an inroad into the music industry or so he told me was fulfill his part of the bargain, which was, you'll get a percentage of this band if you can get them in front of people in the entertainment industry. He said he could, but his he could was a gamble. So with my process, I am totally transparent. My objective is not to try and make money out of you selling courses, because if you live in Oxford, you can get those courses for free. What my objective is, is to get people behind the scenes in the entertainment industry so they can become the next Lady Gaga, the next Beatles, the next Rolling Stones, the next whatever it happens to be your particular type of music is. Because you best know how to meet the people and show the people what it is you can do. But what you will have with an IP approach is this. Anybody who hears that you're involved with creating IPs will understand that you're not just someone who is involved with music. It just happens to be that music is the product that I know you can deliver because you're a musician. Now, if your music isn't of the standard of a Lady Gaga, of a Kerry Hilson, who made the mistakes with the way in which she conducted herself, but if your music isn't the, of the standard of a Lady Gaga, a Kerry Hilson, uh, a Beyonce, uh, uh, a Nine Inch Nails, a Coldplay, a Metallica, then the reason why you failed is because your music isn't up to the standard. So the thing that you're using as your IP vehicle to get into the entertainment industry, okay, will fail on the basis of your music not being up to standard. So as said before, if we go back and we run the clock about 300 years, Mozart, the way in which Mozart would make more money is to sell sheet music. The way in which you make money today is to be part of the IP development process. Most studio owners should be honest enough to tell you that they're not involved in uh, developing IPs. That's not what they do. They're a recording service, okay, which is neither good nor bad, right nor wrong. But the way in which you get into the music industry today is not based around you selling music. If it was, everybody who was listed in that uh, 2009 IFP report who was online with social media profiles or trying to sell themselves to, to their uncle, their cousin and their dog um, would be making a lot of money. So the issue is this. What I do is I focus on getting people behind the scenes in the entertainment industry and I look at that being accomplished within about six weeks. You get behind in the entertainment industry, you can meet some of the biggest movers and shakers, and once you meet some of the biggest movers and shakers, it's now in your hands to develop your career in the way that you want to. And part of that is IP development, which includes learning how to sell out stadiums. So with that, this is Derek James signing off, bringing this presentation to an end with an understanding that it's about perspectives and you developing a game plan based around you and knowing how to play the chess game. 
that is going to be the reason why you can become a winner in music. So this is Derek James signing off, thanking you for your time, your interest, and look to see you guys soon or in the next part of this presentation. Hi, my name is Derek James and we're here now uh, with part three of our talent network stroke recruiting drive for people that want to be in the music industry and uh, this presentation is really about uh, the subject of intellectual property. Now the reason for me uh, covering intellectual property will make sense, I'm hoping, in the next, let's just say uh, two minutes of this presentation. Okay, stage one. All I've been speaking about at this present moment in time or in um, audio one, uh, audio video one, audio video two is about live stage performances. So we've got the stadium behind us. The idea is if, you, if you're a band, if you're an artist, and you can fill out a stadium, whether it's a small one like this or, you know, the, the venues that are bigger, you're now well on your way to have an established career. Okay, now we all understand that the music industry has got many people that are involved in the music business process. So you've got the people that will make the music videos, you've got the people that will organise tours, you've got the riggers, you've got managers, you have got maybe your publicists, and all of these people that surround an artist with the idea that in support of a particular person or a set of people, a group of people, you're going to turn unknowns into knowns or you're going to be involved in the process of keeping somebody's career up and going. But irrespective of all of these activities that take place around singers, actors, music makers, it's all about the audience. When you turn up, do people turn up to see you? This is what this business is about. So it's about the audience creation business. Now, if you can create an audience, so in the last presentation, I was talking to people primarily that were kind of like, um, had the potential to be involved in the talent finding business. Now, in this presentation, I'm speaking to you guys that may be the actual artist or the band members that are looking to become the next big thing. Okay, so the key word here is intellectual property. What is intellectual property? Intellectual property is the actual thing that has value. And you've got to make a distinction between intellectual property and you as a songwriter, you as a song performer, you as a band, because it's the intellectual property that record labels or music companies want to sign into. That's what they want to own. And they want to own the people or work with the people that can create good intellectual property. Now I'm going to use um, a couple of case histories here of bands and artists that didn't make it but maybe could have, bands and artists that were once famous and then lost their fame, and bands and artists that made a mess of their career on the public stage in front of the public and you'll understand, okay, what I am in this music business thing is what counts. Now, the easiest way for me to explain it is kind of like this. If I gave you a piano, so let's just say I gave you a Steinway. Everybody understands that Steinway piano is one of the best pianos in the world. Acoustically, the art form um, of the way in which it's made and so on. Steinway is one of the big brands in the piano world. But it's also understood that the piano is only as good as the person who plays it. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Now, in the entertainment industry, the way it is going and has been going since the World Wide Web has turned up is it's going in the direction, the music industry is now going in the direction of the music industry is only as good as the people that get involved and participate. Now, with that being said, we have to understand what intellectual property is. Now, I would like to think that by August 2017, the Rewind Group website will be rehashed, um, upgraded, all shiny and glossy, and with its new set of service offers uh, outlined on the website that you can then go and look at. And what you'll notice is that I'm involved in film, um, music, documentary making, uh, film production, said that already, um, and virtual reality experiences. All of those areas that I am involved with, I can actually be involved with the production or the creation process. In other words, I turn up and I do my thing. It's like a pianist turning up and doing his thing, okay? So it's obvious that the virtual reality experiences that I'm involved in producing, the films that I'm going to be looking to raise money for, 
the documentaries that I want to then sell into TV companies, everything is only as good as how it's created as a product that a user, i.e. a television company, a movie company, will want to buy. In other words, I'm involved in creating IPs. A band or an artist is an IP. So, to some extent, I do look at people with regards to their talent, but there's, it's obvious that there's music art forms that I am not going to be that versed in. So there's things that I will like, and all of us, when we listen to the radio, there are songs that we hear that aren't part of the genre of music that we may uh, listen to when we're at home, but if it's on the radio and we're driving from A to B, then we, we've got the radio on and we'll listen to a track. It's not offensive, we kind of like it, but it's not the thing we would buy. But what it is, is it's a thing that we'll listen to and it keeps us kind of abreast of what's going on. Now, if you take that passive involvement in intellectual property one step further, it's obvious that there are things that you'll hear on the radio that isn't really for you, but you know, you'll listen to it. But then the difference between the things that you will listen to because it's on the radio versus the things that you will listen to because you're going to go to a stadium to look at a band, look at an artist, that's a completely different issue. You're making a choice to go to a venue where you want to be entertained by the very thing you like. Now, a number of years ago, I saw Michael Jackson, saw him live, brilliant performance, saw his sister again live, brilliant performance. But those people had what it took to get me out of my seat and travel over 60 miles to go to a venue much bigger than this to go and see those people perform. Okay. Now, the reason why I've just used that as an example with regards to going to a venue to see people perform is that the new test, the true test, the ultimate test of a band or an artist is will people get off their ass, go to a venue, go and see you, okay? Likes on social media isn't kind of it. Now, it can be an indicator and it should be a good indicator, but if you've got a thousand people liking you, a thousand people liking you aren't all going to turn up at this um, stadium to go and see you. In like manner, there are lots of bands and artists that you may like, but you're not going to go and see those people live. So the more people that you can get to see you live, it's a better indication of where you're going to be going with regards to you becoming an intellectual property. Now, I need to say this. A number of years ago, a few years ago, a girl... Uh, saw my website. She got in contact with me through a mutual third party who I was hoping to do some work with. She wanted to be an actress, okay? And, you know, I thought, okay, fine, she wants to be an actress, great. We were having a number of conversations and th repeatedly throughout a number of these conversations, she kept asking me, well, can you get, art no, have you got um, money um, for artists? And I didn't really know where she was coming from, and I really mean this. And it wasn't until she disappeared that the penny dropped, and I found out that she had a production company. And what she was looking for was money for her. That, that's the, what I deduced from these conversations. The truth of the matter is, so now we're going to start going into this idea of intellectual property. Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, uh, uh, Jennifer um, Hudson, Beyonce, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, and we can go on, are all names that you will know. But all of these people have a status, a currency, in the world of entertainment that governs, one, how much money they could get for a movie, but beyond that, if you were going to make a, a movie with Jennifer Lawrence, so she's been in X-Men, and we all know a number of films that Jennifer Lawrence has been involved with. Jennifer Lawrence has a status, and, and she is what you would call a bonded actress. What that means is this. If I raised money for a Jennifer Lawrence film, then Jennifer Lawrence being in that film, I could get insurance for it. So if something happens, and uh, like, for instance, if you two were going to play at this um, stadium, and for some unknown reason, two days before the U2 concert, it was washed out. Rain came down, it just wouldn't stop. Uh, the, the, the venue collapsed, um, everything went wrong. And there, was a, and there was a tornado, you know, ultimate, ultimate uh, disaster. I could get insurance for a U2 con uh, concert not taking place because unforeseen circumstances has stopped the concert from going ahead. But it's obvious that U2 as a band, if playing at a stadium like this, would fill it out, I would make a certain amount of money. And so I could get insurance for everything that had gone wrong. 
and I could get cover for maybe potentially part of the profits or whatever that happened to be. Depends on the insurance contract. But the point is that an unknown band, an unknown artist, an unknown actor, an unknown actress doesn't have all of those things working for them where they are an IP where you can maybe get, let's just say, um, insurance and those type of things and then when you now start looking at things like sponsorship we start moving forward we see how things are going to go wrong now there's a video that I'm going to be advising people to look at when we start doing our social media feeds for new bands and artists and in these social media feeds there is a, a, a there's a singer well she was a songwriter very famous in 2009 ish onwards in that time time period she wrote for everybody and i'm talking about like the pussycat dolls who were big at the time britney spears and we can go on her resume in terms of the, her writing credits were huge right and what then took place was she was somebody who was then being moved into becoming the next potential um, rihanna stroke beyonce she had the videos she had the songs she had the album releases that were all done because she was somebody who, as, an, as a songwriter, had penned hits for lots of people. So her career trajectory from a behind-the-scenes process was very similar in nature to that of Lady Gaga. But she didn't end up with the results of Lady Gaga, i.e. being a big-named uh, singer with a big acting career as well, because she got involved in an argument in the public sphere with people like Beyonce and Rihanna uh, and she put out a, 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 what you, they would call a diss song about a number of artists who she had written for okay so it's kind of like biting the hand that feeds you now um, she had put out a diss song about basically her claiming to be a better singer a better artist a better performer as time went on the fans of Beyonce, Rihanna and other R&B artists turned against this one songstress and they said how dare you. Now from a behind the scenes perspective um, most people don't look at the credits of who wrote what they don't and the person who is carrying the flame for a specific song so let's just say it's a Rihanna, a Lady Gaga, a Shakira that's who they look at the fact that there may be a producer involved the fact that there may be um, a, a songwriter involved for most of the public isn't really what they care they care about they're looking at the IP i.e. Rihanna she's the IP the intellectual property they're looking at Beyonce she's the IP they're looking at Lady Gaga she's the IP they're looking at Shakira she's the IP okay now it's i don't really want to go too much into that case history because the link for that video um the, the name of the singer is actually uh, uh kerry hilson so if you look at the kerry hilson video um and the tag that you can type into youtube then you look at that five minute video of her case history who she was what she was doing behind the scenes everything on paper looked great she was moving with some of the biggest in the industry but her mouth put her in a situation where she basically alienated herself against the very fans that also bought rihanna and beyonce and would buy her and people said no 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 we're going to make a choice in the direction of rihanna beyonce and a, a number of other singers we don't want to have anything to do with you because we think you're rude now imagine that that has been the fan backlash to now again you look at that video and what you see is all of the things that this singer had to do or this emerging star was trying to do to then pick up the pieces from the mistakes she made it didn't work and how many years later Rihanna, Beyonce, Gaga and so on are the big singers that we all know this other person is a non-entity why because she did something in the public sphere that the public in other words the fans for that genre of music said no so she stopped herself from becoming an intellectual property now there's a part in that video where um, Kerry Hilson is performing at, and then the, the commenter ma commentator makes a statement, a partially empty stadium. In other words, she's not the type of band, singer, artist that can fill out stadiums, right? Where the music industry is now, it's all about being able to perform live. The fact that you sell a few albums, the fact that you sell a few t-shirts is kind of like the icing on the cake. It's not the heart of the business. And so all of the people that were around this singer, Kerry Hilson, that gave her bad advice with regards to this is what you need to do to launch your career, 
all of those people and there was one guy who was trying to basically help pick up the pieces because it seemed as if he was the instigator for this disc campaign and the idea of the disc campaign was that if you had two people having a public argument it would help build um, publicity for the band or artist. Now you've heard the saying um, that um, all publicity is good publicity. Well it's obvious that in the case of Kerry Hilson all publicity was not good publicity because everything that she did killed her career. Long and short of it. So you look at that video that goes it's only five minutes but I think that it's a very good synopsis of the rise the potential that was unrealized and the fall of an artist who had everything that was necessary to become a big success but she messed it up herself now what you'll notice on my website again it won't be launched until maybe august september 2000 and the reason why it is because my website isn't really for public consumption what it is is for people in the industry to know what it is i'm doing so that they can then call me it's a, basically it's an industry calling card but you can look at it and just take a, a, a kind of casual look you're looking at you see okay but you'll see that i'm involved in a number of projects that aren't all about music in actual fact i didn't even think i was going to be involved with the music industry ever again because there was a point in time where i left the music business because a number of artists do kind of like what kerry hilson does but they do it in different ways ignorance isn't bliss you have to know what the business is and the thing about the music business now is that it's all about the person who is involved with the music understanding what they're doing now a couple of years ago more than a couple about a decade ago i was involved with somebody who was a multi-million selling producer and um in a nutshell i used to give him advice and say look this is what i think you should be doing and there came a point where he wasn't really listening and I'm looking and going, he's going off of the edge of the uh, cliff here. And there came a point where I basically had to cut my ties and leave my involvement with him because everything that he was doing was not going to help his career move forward. And as we move more into a new set of rules, um, and there's a, a producer by the name of uh, Linda Opes. She, I did an interview with her. Now, she's produced some of the biggest films in Hollywood. Um, and uh, one of the last films that she did was uh, a film called uh, Interstellar with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Christopher Nolan. So we know those two people, huge names in the business. Um, and she spoke about there's a new normal in the world of film. So you can't just walk up to somebody in the film industry and say, oh, I've got a great idea for a movie. Um, will you uh, fund it? Because what the movie industry is looking for are IPs. In other words, now, I want you to understand this. There's a guy by the name of Jay Samet. If you happen to be able to get a hold of any of his videos online, he was somebody in the music industry who was a big hitter. Huge. No, film industry, sorry. Big hitter. Um, huge. Got it wrong. He actually was involved with film, moved into music, became one of the biggest um, executives in the music industry. And Jay Samet his latest project he's actually involved with technology he's actually moved out of the music business and there's a reason he's moved out of the music business and has gone into something completely different which is not entertainment industry related um and he's done something that is kind of similar to a guy by the name of peter churning now who's peter churning peter churning if you look at the last set of um, planet of the apes uh, movies he's the guy that has produced those peter churning used to be the head of um a film studio and he would manage people that were putting out movies. And what Peter Chernin did was he resigned that position as the head of a studio to concentrate on being a producer and just putting out the movies that he likes. Why? Because managing other creatives that don't get it is sometimes just very difficult. So what he can do is he's just managing himself and his projects and not taking on the responsibility of a studio the reason why Jay Samet left the industry was because he made a statement about marketing coming up with new ideas for new bands new artists and he basically said I'm now summarizing and paraphrasing he says a lot of headache now for the same reason I didn't really want to be involved with uh, music people because sometimes you're giving people advice and they're kind of like going now if you look at the Kerry Hilson video you see how someone can crash and burn their own their own um, their own potential even if they're in the environment where they've got every single advantage working for them, working with some of the biggest names, having worked with some of the biggest names, but now when it's time for them to take centre stage, they mismanage who they are with what they've got. Okay. Now, here I've got a T-shirt. And uh, this T-shirt comes from a band. The band has since, uh, they've broken up a number of years ago. But this band here, Nation, 
um, they were kind of key, to, I believe, I think, to be the next, oh gosh, how am I going to... I'm not going to say Beatles, Rolling Stones, uh, Nirvana, you know, because every band is different, but they were that type of a rock act. Uh, they would come to my office once every three months. I'd give them some advice. They disappeared, disappeared for a while. I didn't see them. They then came out with an album. But what they did was they built up a big enough following that when they booked out the new theater to do a gig, they you know, filled out the new theater. Brilliant um, achievement. And... Um, in terms of understanding how to play the chess game, they got it. The light bulb switched on. They did everything that was necessary for them to get into the industry. They had built up a fan base. They had a following. Now, this was pre the internet that we know now. So we're talking about around about 2007, 2008. But here's the point. I gave that band to somebody who purported to be involved in the entertainment industry with good, strong industry ties now i know that he had he had an industry uh, career he had sold multiple millions of albums so his credibility in terms of his achievements were there but behind the scenes he didn't really tell me about the strength of his relationships i didn't know that the strength of his relationships were kind of weak and what he was basically hoping i believe was that this band that i had given him um would be his next ticket in or his next next potential big find because they had done everything that was required of them to become a brand name locally now when it became apparent that things weren't going to work out with him being their champion i pulled and i just I, there were a number of things that this guy had been involved with which, which i just said now nah, this just isn't adding up now i run a course in oxford which is all about helping people get into the entertainment industry but the way that i have set up the course and devised the course is this i say to everybody listen you can get inside the entertainment industry within six weeks of doing my course you do it my way you get in now how you manage yourself behind the scenes once you're inside the industry is up to you you can either be smart like lady gaga or do things like kerry hilson and just mess up your own um your own potential I'm not responsible for you acting like Kerry Hilson. I'm not. I can't be held responsible for that. That makes no sense. That's down to your own political savvy. Now, locally, um, the British government, and this is why, if you look on the uh, Rewind website from August onwards, you'll see a TV show that I'm putting together called uh, The Billionaires. And it's all about how women can get the chance to become a billionaire by winning a prize that involves them being in front of multiple millions of people around the world tv advertising campaigns and all sorts of things now how that whole program has been put together how it's going to be funded how it's going to be um marketed that's all out of my own head but it's an intellectual property that isn't based on me waiting for a band an artist a famous singer a famous actor to be involved with projects different projects have different types of requirements in by 2020 we've got a project that in terms of the next 36 months leads up to us uh, myself and another guy by the name of dr zhu zhang being in front of 3.5 billion potential um olympics viewers with a thing called olympics hacked and it's all about virtual reality and the olympics games that's another ip that i'm involved with but what you'll hear me say just what you've just heard me say there when i spoke about 3.5 Five billion people was a means by which I could devise a project that would that has been funded that can get an audience and TV companies will buy into that so everything that I do is all about how do you create audiences whether it be for a reality show whether it be for movies a future movie franchise whether it be for a band or an artist playing at a stadium like this so that they can then move on to play at those big huge stadiums like you two now, I'm going to go back to an idea that I just seeded you with that I'm going to continue the story. A few years ago, no, it was, it was about seven years ago, British government gave us a bunch of money for this part of the world to be involved with projects that would teach people how to set up businesses, how to move into the world of the arts and so on. So there was a radio station, a television, there was a radio station. There was a uh, media production room and uh, there was another, um, the radio station, the media production room and a recording studio. What took place with the uh, recording studio, I'm speaking to Dan now, who is the head of the studio, with regards to him sending artists my way that I can build these packages around. Okay. With regards to the radio station, that's not really doing too well and the multimedia room has crashed. In fact, a lot of the projects that were 
um, coming out of that community centre haven't really gone on to do anything in the world after receiving this half a million uh, pounds in English money, which in American money is about three quarters of a million dollars, because the head of the project or the person that took over the project didn't know what they were doing. So I want you to think of it kind of like Kerry Wilson style. Whether or not someone has the ability is immaterial. What you're looking for is people that can produce results. Okay. So the way in which I've run, I'm now running my industry access program is really simple. There are lots of people who will go and do degrees and they can't get inside the music or film industry. Why? Because there is a who you know, what you know uh, quotient that works on here. The people that took over our project who thought they knew what they were doing and used underhanded means to try and um, further themselves found out that it wasn't that easy, that having access to equipment was the way in which things worked. You have to work with the people that know how to create the intellectual property because the intellectual property is the only thing that has value. Having equipment can be a means to an end of you achieving intellectual property status in the world of film or music. It can be. But having equipment like Kerry Wilson and mismanaging that process makes no sense. Why? Because you can have all of the equipment in the world, but if you do not manage yourself correctly, okay, then what's going to happen is your project isn't going to work well. So what I am doing with my industry access program, for those of you that are involved with music, is really simple. I'm letting everybody and anyone who's anybody have access to the world of the entertainment industry. But the real test of how you are gonna progress is what takes place behind the scenes in the industry. Are you gonna be a Kerry Wilson or are you gonna be a Lady Gaga? At a local level, you might be the, the, the next um, potential big thing, but the issue isn't are you great locally because being great locally may not mean anything within the context of can you fill out a stadium like this because filling out a stadium like this is kind of like what the major labels are looking for as an indicator to show that you as a potential Lady Gaga, you as a potential Green Day, you as a potential Coldplay, you as a potential U2, you as a potential Nine Inch Nails are the real deal. People who can fill out stadiums have done something that um, people who once sold records were able to do. Now, we all know what a barcode is, so you, you buy a CD, you buy any product, and it's got a barcode. With a barcode, the way that record labels used to use barcodes was a means by which they could find out where bands and artists are selling so that they could then plan the tours that would give a band or an artist the ability to fill out a stadium like this. Barcodes no longer work because people are not buying records. Beyond that, a lot of the record stores have actually closed. So when you look at some of the big chains in America, say uh, Tower Records, in the UK it's HMV, those chains don't work. And so the ability to use a barcode system to find out who's selling how many where, so that you've got a, a temperature gauge for how successful a tour could be in a certain place, you can't use the barcode system. What you can do now, though, is use people's social media following as an indicator with regards to you sh find out how many people there are out there that like a certain artist. So in the case of Shakira, she's got 105 million social media followers. Now, with 105 social media uh, followers around the globe, if Shakira tells people she's doing a concert tour and she lists the stadiums that she's at she can sell out a concert tour within about two hours now you're not going to be at that stage at day one but it's your political savvy that's going to give you the ability to take on board some of the things that i'm involved with and work with those and use those platforms as the means by which you get in front of a thousand two thousand ten thousand twenty thousand a hundred thousand a million two million 5 million, 10 million, and we can go. Now, remember, I've already stated that I'm involved with a project that is designed to get one person in front of 3.5 billion people. Magazines like Tech Mix that I've already shown you show how there are certain people that are involved in the computer games business that are, involved, that are in front of multiple billions of people. That's the way that the industry is going. So you have to be the person that has got the savvy to work in a way with and take instructions from, I'm not saying or direction from, because it's not a question of someone says jump and then you say how high, but from an artistic point of view, it's you understand that there is this environment that you can now be in where you can be in front of ever-increasing 
numbers of people, but it's how you manage yourself when you're in front of those people. And in the first instance, you may want to take some advice, and then you say, right, okay, I get how this operates. But again, by looking at the Kerry Hilson video, you can see someone who went off track, had all of the resources, working with the biggest producers, working with some of the biggest names in the industry, but said things that actually killed their own career. Now, as I said, this TV show idea that I'm working on called The Billionaires is all based on being able to identify the people that have the talent to come up with the business ideas. So look at the um, Billionaires um, reality TV show commercial. It's already there. It should be on YouTube. But this um, concept is really simple. I took a failed project run by failed people. In other words, it's kind of like looking at, you look at Kerry Hilson, you say, wow, that is not what I want to do. In other words, you've learned the lesson from something that is not going to work and you can see why and in like manner I understood how when a, a national institution or the local government or the national government gives an area money how it's mismanaged so you take that mismanaged process you flip it in reverse and you understand okay if you point the camera in the direction of people that have got talent those people will turn up and they will make the best of an opening because they understand that with these resources they now have the potential to make a billion dollars um, from anything that they're involved with in the world of business okay so your job as an artist is really simple I believe it's to understand that if you're involved with the Rewind Group, we can, we can create the platform that will give you the ability to be in front of ever-increasing numbers. But it's how smart you are with those ever-increasing numbers that's going to govern whether or not you are a Lady Gaga or a Kerry Hilson. In terms of, I'm just using those in terms of career outcomes. Lady Gaga, at the beginning of her career, did everything that she thought was necessary to get into the industry. She worked with some of the biggest in the industry behind the scenes. She got a deal with one of the biggest record labels and one of the biggest management companies. It didn't work out. Lady Gaga did everything she did, um, what she thought was correct, to make it happen. She then went with another management company and another uh, record label, another one of the big ones, and Lady Gaga is today what she is because she knew she didn't make any mistakes. First time around, she just said, uh, you know, she got with another company who got her, really got her, and everything that Lady Gaga is now is because she managed herself right. But again, if you go to the Kerry Hilson video and you look at that, in terms of it, it's a career synopsis of the rise and fall of a singer who should, uh, sorry, a songwriter who should have been one of the biggest names in the industry today. You look at that career so synopsis and it becomes obvious, I think, why things didn't work out. And you, in looking at the Kerry Hilson video, you've got to say, okay, fine, we think we're going to be the next. Now, with all of that being said, I can bring this presentation to a close with an understanding that what you're looking to become is an IP. And what that means is you are looking to become the lightning rod that's going to fill out these stadiums. Being behind the scenes and being a writer for other people is great because that's the function that you're looking to fill. But if the, if the song um, performer is Elvis Presley, then it's understood that Elvis Presley is the one that's going to get all of that center stage attention because of who he is. That makes sense. But if you're not Elvis Presley, even though you've written the songs for Elvis Presley, that doesn't mean that you can become a center stage artist. What the internet allows you to do is go through a process of developing who you're going to be so that you can then start filling out stadiums like this and moving on to bigger things without the record label putting in the commitment that was given to um, Carrie Hilson, which is a lot of money, a lot of money. You look at the videos that she's had made, record labels, it record, the record label invests a lot of money in Carrie Hilson, but Carrie Hilson blew up her own um, start and finish because she thought she could do it in a certain way, which was, was, was basically beef culture. Um, and in that beef culture of having arguments with ar other artists, believed that that was going to be the means by which she was going to raise her profile to another, le le another level, backfired. So the point that I'm making here is this, is that where we are now in a world where you can get in front of up to a billion people, because that's the way the technology is going, you need to be involved in a process where you understand that as somebody, as an artist, you building your audience for who you are and what you do is really based on you just having the savvy to use the resources that make sense, not only to you, but to the media people that are looking at you.
The record industry is now looking for IPs, not just singers. As we can see with Kerry Hilson, one of the best singers of recent times. She didn't make it because it was because of mismanagement. So what I'm saying is this, is that if you are a talent scout, look for the people that have got a bit of this about them. If you are the band or an artist, the way in which we're doing this uh, program in Oxford is simple. If you live in Oxford, you can come to any of the courses for free and um, you can then start looking to get involved in the industry. The reason why I want people behind the scenes in the industry is simple. The more people that there are doing the Kerry Hilson process who get it right are the more Lady Gaga's I'm going to end up working with. Does that make sense? Okay. And with that being said, if you're someone who lives outside of Oxford, then we've got, um, there's a minimal cost for coming into Oxford to do a course because the courses that I run are held at the college. I don't do courses out there where it's for the public, just like my record, uh, just like the uh, Rewind website, I service the industry. Um, um, then if you are coming from overseas, we've got something, again, you can look online um, and you can see how that all works. But the bottom line is this, I am looking for as many people as possible to get behind the scenes who they can be in a position that is similar to Kerry Hilson, who will manage that process correctly and then become the, the next Marvin Gaye, the next Diana Ross, the next Pharrell Williams, the next, you, know, you put your own name in the blank with regards to achievement level. So with that, I'm going to bring this session to a close with an understanding that you want to become an IP. In other words, you want to become an intellectual property artist who it's your name that is selling out stadiums. Why? Because there are enough people that like you who want to get off their rear end and travel maybe 60 miles to go and see you because they like what you're about. That is what the currency of the industry is about. Sell it, putting together an album and selling that to a couple of hundred people online isn't really it. It's all about becoming an IP. And out of that IP process, you could then set out stadiums that are bigger than this. Out of that IP process, you could be someone who's writing for f uh, film soundtracks. Out of that IP process, you are somebody that when you appear at a venue like this, loads of people turn up and you've got a lot of people who are then willing to buy your downloads because you are liked by enough people for the marketing process that you're involved with to actually reap the type of dividends that you want. So with that, this is Derek James signing off, thanking you for your time, your interest, and see you at a workshop, see you at a venue like this, see you at venues much bigger than this. Okay, so with that, we'll bring this session to a close. Bye.